seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know the night that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. 24 hours after giving this speech, Dr. Martin Luther King was dead. Tonight, the man imprisoned for his murder will, for the first time, have his day in court. years ago today, here on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, at one minute past six in the evening, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was murdered. He was standing here, leaning over this railing, talking to a musician in his entourage in the parking lot below, when a single shot tore through his face, ending both his life and the civil rights movement as the nation had come to know it under his leadership. Dr. King was 39 years old. After all these years, it's still a matter of some dispute where the fatal bullet came from. It allegedly came from a rear window of that rooming house over there from a 30 6 rifle fired by James Earl Ray. Ray was a petty crook whose history of armed robbery earned him a 20-year sentence in 1960. In 1967, he escaped from the Jefferson City Penitentiary in the back of a bread truck. A year later, in April, Dr. King was killed. Two weeks later, the FBI traced Ray's fingerprints to the rifle allegedly used in the murder and issued a warrant for his arrest. On June 8, 1968, Ray was captured in London and returned to Memphis to stand trial for the murder of Dr. King. The nation was in turmoil. During the summer of 68, reeling from the King assassination and the murder two months later of Robert Kennedy, the country's major cities erupted in rioting, arson, and bloodshed. It was in this climate that in March 1969, Ray pled guilty in order to avoid the electric chair on the advice of his flamboyant Texas lawyer, Percy Foreman. Did you ever feel that you could ever do more than save his life? Never at any time, and so told him from the day I came in. And he never expected anything else from the first, and I never expected to accomplish this. Three days later, Ray changed his mind, fired his lawyer, and wrote the judge asking for a trial. That request was denied, and in spite of numerous appeals for a trial, Ray has spent the last 24 years in prison and has survived numerous attempts on his life. Still, questions remain. Was Ray a lone gunman? Was he part of a larger conspiracy? Or is he, as he claims, an innocent dupe framed for the murder of Dr. King? A sense of uncertainty haunts this case and fuels continuing anxiety over whether justice was served in one of the great tragedies of our time. Tonight, in an effort to probe the mystery of Dr. King's death, James Earl Ray will finally have his day in court. An impartial jury has been impaneled. Real witnesses will be called. There will be no actors and no script. James Earl Ray will testify live via satellite from his Nashville prison and will see and hear the state's case against him. At the end of the program, the jury will hand down its verdict. The prosecution team will be headed by W. Hickman Ewing, who served for 10 years as the United States Attorney for the Western District of Tennessee. He will be assisted by Glenn Wright, a former state prosecutor for the Memphis area. The defense team will be led by William Pepper, an American lawyer who practices in London. Pepper has been Ray's unpaid counsel for the past five years. 
he will be joined by April Ferguson, a public defender in Memphis. Presiding will be Judge Marvin Frankel, who for 13 years served as a federal trial judge in New York. The prosecution must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that James Earl Ray murdered Dr. King by pulling the trigger himself or by intentionally helping someone else do it. The prosecution will rely on six principal points in an effort to persuade the jury that Ray is guilty. First, testimony that the fatal shot came from the bathroom window of a rooming house about 200 feet from the Lorraine Motel where Dr. King was killed. Second, evidence that several hours before the shooting, James Earl Ray, using the name John Willard, had rented a room in that rooming house. Third, the discovery, minutes after the shooting, of a rifle with Ray's fingerprints on it in a doorway next to the rooming house. Fourth, proof that Ray had bought the rifle using the name Harvey Lohmeyer several days earlier in Birmingham, Alabama. Fifth, a claim that Ray had stalked Dr. King for weeks before the shooting. And finally, evidence that following the murder, Ray fled to Canada, where he secured a false passport and traveled to London and to Lisbon in an effort to avoid arrest. Let's listen as Prosecutor Hickman Ewing presents the state of Tennessee's case against James Earl Ray. Mr. Ewing. The facts, ladies and gentlemen, and I would ask you in this case, to keep your eyes on what the charge is. James Earl Ray is charged with murdering Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. That, that's what we're trying here. The proof, I submit, that we'll introduce in this case will be overwhelming as to Mr. Ray's guilt. Dr. Martin Luther King, as you know, was a great leader in the Civil Rights Movement. He was standing on the balcony at 6.01 p.m. on April the 4th, 1968. He was shot. One bullet, right here. And he died within an hour. You will hear what happened. That immediately, and you'll see the geography, you look up and there's a vacant lot and there's the back of two old rooming houses. And so within a minute or so, there were police on the scene and they covered the thing. They ran around the front of the building of the rooming house and within a matter of minutes found a bundle with a bedspread over it and in there was a rifle box and a rifle and binoculars. The rifle had a scope on it. Uh, they determined, and you'll hear what happened as the police went into the rooming house, there was a man who had checked in that afternoon about 3 or 3.30. It's James Earl Ray, we know now. Uh, he gave the name John Willard. Within the next day, within 12 hours, they determined that this particular rifle had been bought in Birmingham on March 30th, 1968, uh, by a man named Harvey Lohmeyer. So they're looking for Willard and Lohmeyer. Eric Galt, who we now know as James Earl Ray, was in Atlanta from March 24th. He got a room there. And you'll see the evidence that comes in as far as the map found in his room showing circles around his rooming house, a circle near the home of Dr. Martin Luther King, a circle near his church, the Ebenezer Baptist Church. You'll hear the evidence and the identification of Mr. Ray, the fingerprint evidence that's on the rifle. We expect James Earl Ray, in this case, the proof will be, it's anybody but me. It's a, it's a guy named Raul that, that made me get to where I did. It may be the FBI. It may be the CIA. It's anybody but me. But the issue ultimately for you is, did Mr. Ray kill Dr. King? Thank you. Mr. Pepper, <clears throat> you're going to be taken down the path of a, of a journey that, um, that sometimes will boggle the imagination. James Earl Ray has been waiting 25 years to talk to you, 25 years to tell you his story, and now he has an opportunity to do so. I ask you to consider James Earl Ray's capability in respect of this monumental crime. James was a convict on the run, an escaped prisoner being hunted. 
You will learn a good deal about him personally, and you will have to assess his capability for the commission of one of the most heinous and horrible, yet monumental crimes in the history of this republic. Dr. King was led to the slaughter and killed by forces he understood all too well, and forces he opposed a great deal of his adult life. When Dr. King moved from the civil rights movement, which was his main calling, and decided to go into other arenas, that of opposition to the war in Vietnam, and then began to become involved increasingly in the plight of poor people, and so he would be addressing economic issues, it had the effect of consolidating forces against him that, to that point in time, always had animosity but that animosity eventually became lethal. The defense will show that not only was he throughout the period of this type of activity harassed and intimidated, not by James Earl Ray, but by forces of government on every side, but that eventually this led to other efforts, other attempts to kill him and to his ultimate death. Now, James Earl Ray was also manipulated. But in James' case, ladies and gentlemen, he was manipulated and controlled by forces to this very day he doesn't understand and cannot identify. James O'Ray, the defense will establish, was a patsy. He did what he was told. He received money for doing what he was told. He was moved around the country. He bought items so that he would leave a paper trail that could be easily followed. And that long path led ultimately to Memphis, Tennessee, the scene of the murder of Dr. King, which it was planned by people whom he never knew. I commend you to your task. Mr. Ewing, you ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Call Reverend Cowles. The state's first witness is the Reverend Billy Kyle, a Memphis clergyman with a long relationship with Dr. King. Kyle was on the balcony with King when the fatal shot was fired. His testimony is important to the prosecution in seeking to establish where the fatal shot came from. Morning. Morning. Would you state your name, please, sir? Uh, Samuel Billy Kyle. Reverend Kyle. On April the 4th, 1968, uh, at 6 p.m., 6.01 p.m., were you present when Dr. King was shot? Yes, I was. How long had you known Dr. King uh, as of the time of his demise in 1968? Uh, Martin and I had been friends uh, for at least 10 years or more. We're here now in 1993, and... and uh, Everybody on the jury wasn't that old back then, but could you tell us, you, you mentioned some of the, the purposes to break down some of the racial barriers, but can you give us some examples? Um, there was total separation of the races in the South. Even here in Memphis, you could not even come into a place uh, like this courtroom seeking justice, and if you wanted a drink of water, you had to find a colored fountain. You couldn't use the facilities, public, public libraries, buses, uh, a complete uh, disregard for the rights of, 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 of African American people. There was so much, uh, there was a great deal of violence. There were always threats against the life of Dr. King. How about the governmental entities like, let's say, the in Alabama, the governor of Alabama, the governor of Mississippi, what were their positions during this? Oh, well, they were just opposed to it. I mean, they uh, did not want the campaigns that Dr. King led to take place in, in their towns. Uh, Reverend Kyles he, describes Dr. King's leadership of a mass march in support of the Memphis sanitation strikers on March 28th. The march broke up in violence. There, there was literally thousands of people. They, they showed up. Uh, families, fathers and mothers and children, and you could hear this tremendous sound coming down Beale Street. 
of, of, of windows being broken. And there were some young fellows had taken the sticks off the signs and started knocking out windows. We learned later that these, these fellows had been hired to do that. They were in pay, they, many of them were in the payroll of the, FBI, of the FBI. Now, did Dr. King then return to Memphis on, on the morning of April the 3rd, 1968? Yes, he did. Do you, do you recall where he went and, and where, what motel he went to? Uh, yes, Dr. King always stayed at the, at the uh, Lorraine Motel when he came to Memphis. Now, let me ask you, could anybody that was in the city of Memphis, could they have known that Dr. King was staying at the Lorraine Motel? Oh, yes, it was, it was quite prominent in the news. But I, it struck me as being very unusual that you would give the room number. Tell us where he was standing and where you were and who was down in the courtyard and just kind of the prior to the to the shot uh we went on the balcony i got about four steps four or five steps away and i heard this tremendous noise i didn't at the time realize it was a shot i looked over into the courtyard and people were ducking and and, and hiding and then i realized that when i looked back I could see Martin's leg up against the uh, railing. One of his shoes may have come off. And I could see, I rushed to him, and I saw this tremendous hole in the right side of his face. I got blood on me and most people on that balcony. It was just blood everywhere. Did, did you hear one loud noise or more than one? Just one. Just one. Let me hand to you. Uh, what has been marked is photograph number 11. Uh, tell us, are, are there in there some people pointing and how that came about, the, the pointing? They're all pointing in, in response to uh, the question from the police, where did the shot come from? All right. Let me hand you another photograph. This is photograph number five. Do you recognize that as a, a view from the balcony toward the west yes i do and tell us what what is depicted in that photograph you see the back of buildings off main street and you see a window um open with a stick in it and uh one of those windows is the window that we were told that the shot was fired from when you looked from the balcony out toward this rooming house of this what you saw to the west did you ever see any people out there in the yard or in the windows or anything like that no i did not <clears throat> thank you reverend cows that's all i have your honor cross examination mr pepper are you familiar with dr king's speech at riverside church on the 4th of april 1967 uh yes slightly i am yes that was his first well, one of his major speeches against the Vietnam War. Right. Would you say that speech engendered a great deal of hostility toward Dr. King throughout the nation? Oh, it did, yes. Were you familiar at the time with the, um, the reactions of uh, uh, government law enforcement agencies with respect to Dr. King, particularly the, uh, the Federal Bureau of Investigation activities in respect of Dr. King at that point in time and earlier? Well, Mr. Hoover made no secret of his, his dislike for Dr. King. I think just uh, weeks or so before he was assassinated, Hoover called him the most notorious liar in the country. Now let's move for a moment to the, the March of March 28th. You have testified that in, in that March, so you learned, was interrupted uh, by violence, by the breaking of windows and the shattering of glass. Is that right? That's right. And you have also testified that the use of those sticks and the breaking of those windows and the shattering of that glass was by paid provocateurs. Is that right? Yes, didn't know that at the time, though. And you have, under the Freedom of Information Act, as a source of your information, learned and determined to your own satisfaction that those paid provocateurs were in fact paid by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Is that your testimony here today? Yes. Or some federal agency. 
Where was Dr. King meant to stay when he came to Memphis on the 3rd of April? At which hotel? At the Lorraine Hotel. It was, it was almost like common practice that he would go there. But isn't it true that on the uh, night of the 18th that he stayed at the Rivermont Hotel? And isn't it true that on the... Yeah, I, was there an answer? I'm sorry. Reverend, did you answer that question? Yes, he did stay at the Rivermont. Right. Moving to the, the broadcast that you mentioned earlier, where even the room number seemed to be spread across the radio. And that concerned you, didn't it? Oh, absolutely. Did you see anything sinister in that broadcast? Um, yes, to give his room number, um, based upon all the threats that, that had come uh, about his life. No further questions, Your Honor. The Lorraine Motel stands on Mulberry Street. It faces the backs of buildings on South Main Street. Standing nearby is a fire station, which in 1968 was run by a joint fire and police department. At 422 and a half South Main Street was a cheap rooming house. Minutes after the shooting, Memphis police converged on this rooming house where they believe the fatal shot came from. They interrogated the landlady, Bessie Brewer, and two occupants, William Anschutz and Charlie Stevens. Mr. Stevens was in, in the front room. Miss Stevens was in the, the far room on the east, the back room. Right. Is this a, actually a two-room situation? Yes, it is. Did you have a conversation with Mr. Stevens? Yes, sir. Uh, well, was, several minutes. Was he standing or sitting? He was standing. Uh, did he appear to have been drinking that night? No, sir, he did not. All right, after you were in, in apartment 6B, and then who did you talk to? Uh, Bessie Brewer. Uh, while you were there talking with her, was she in effect the landlady? Yeah, right. Did you all look at any kind of ledger book uh, in there in her her uh, room or office? Yes, sir, we did. And uh, did you uh, see the name of anyone who had registered for room 5B? Yes, sir. And, and what was the name? Uh, John Willard. John Willard have, is one of uh, James Earl Ray's yeah, aliases. Do you recognize that as a photograph of the bathtub in the Ruman House located at uh, 422 South Main? Yes, sir. On the tub, uh, did you notice any kind of marks inside the tub? Yes, sir. There were, there were marks where someone had stood in the tub. There was, was actually only one that I could tell was a footprint. It was not a lot, but you could tell it was the front part of a shoe. If a person stood in the bathtub, could they get a better shot, hypothetically, if the shot came from the window, than standing on the ground? Yes, sir. The, the window was in such a position that the bathtub sort of blocked your access to it. You had to get over in the tub to get a good, where you could lean out the window or lean in the window. Was there a, a screen in the window when you got there? No, sir, there was not. From the bathroom window, did you look out toward the Lorraine Motel? Yes, sir, I did. And what kind of view did you have? A perfectly clear view of the, of the second floor balcony. Let's talk about a screen for a minute. Was an examination made down on the ground to see if there was a screen down there? Yes, sir, there was a screen there. Now, the, where that was laying, uh, where was that in relation to the bathroom window? Uh, almost directly underneath it. Do uh, you... The bathroom being on the second floor, and it's laying on the ground right under it. Yeah, I believe you made a measurement at one point from the back of the building over to the Lorraine. Is that right? Yes, sir, I did. To waist height, standing on the ground at the Lorraine, from the back wall of the rooming house was 205 feet 3 inches. 
And was there a clear view unobstructed by trees or anything else from the window to the balcony? Yes, sir. Now, moving on to the scope of the investigation, both from the night of the scene of the crime, at the scene of the crime, the next day, and subsequently, were you assisted by the local office of the Federal Bureau of Investigation in your investigation? Yes, sir, we were. Could you describe the manner of that assistance that was provided to you in this investigation? There was mostly a one-way exchange of information with the Bureau. Uh, we gave them information and got little back. Uh, but we did give them all our information. There were FBI agents from the local office in and out of homicide uh, on a regular basis, uh, mostly getting information. Now, you've testified about the ledger book. Yes, sir. I'm interested in that ledger book. Do you know where it is? I don't have any idea. Have you ever heard of become aware in any way what, what has happened to this ledger book? No, sir. What would normally happen with such a vital piece of evidence as a ledger book of a rooming house would, involved in a crime of this sort? Would normally be taken and turned into the police property and evidence room. Uh, whether that was done or not, I don't know. Who would normally take it and turn it in? Any, any investigating officer there could, could do that. Why didn't you yourself, when you had the opportunity, actually seize this vital, potentially vital piece of evidence and take it in, take it under control? I don't know. No further questions. Mr. King, was the this idea of a one-way exchange between the Memphis Police Department Homicide Bureau and the FBI, where you were giving them everything and they're giving you a little bit, was that abnormal or was that typical? That was typical. Would that be true in any kind of case? Yes, sir. Next comes Officer Jim Papia, who also climbed to the second floor of the rooming house. And so as you're going down the corridor, are the first persons you see, the people you say were there at the... And 4B right here, sir. Where did you proceed then? Well, uh, after I talked to them, I went to this room here, which was unoccupied. The door was open. I walked inside. You, uh, there was a chair right here. Uh, window was all the way up. I walked in there over here. This window looked out, and you can see a view of the Lorraine Motel from here. But uh, it's not not that good of a view. I want to show you a couple of photographs. Can you tell us? Uh, if that appears to be a photograph of, of room 5B. Yes, the only difference I see now in relation to what was when I found it on April the 4th is the drape, which is completely down, was up over that uh, mantel, and this one was in the same position. All right. The window, do you see the window sill there? Yeah, this, yes. Right. Was the window open or shut? It was all the way open, all uh, the way up. Did it have a screen in it? No, sir. Did you ever see a screen for that window? No, sir. All right. Did you look out the window? Yes, sir. Uh, and again, could you actually see the Lorraine Motel? Yes, sir. You, you, had, a, you had a fair view of the Lorraine Motel, mainly the uh, southern, uh, southern half of the uh, Lorraine. The, was there a chair by the window as depicted in that yes, photograph? Sir. Yes, sir. It was just flat up against, right next to the wall, and facing uh, east. All right. The, the person there, 4B, could, 
Could you tell if he, he was drunk or sober? At the time I observed him, he was not, uh, his speech was not impaired or slurred, and he was not staggering on his feet. He might have been drinking, sir, but in my opinion, he wasn't under the influence that it impaired his uh, abilities. If we can move to the, um, to the rooming house itself, was the bathroom door open or closed when you reached that room? It was open. Did you see these, this stairway here? Yes, sir. Did you go down that stairway? No, sir. Do you know where that stairway leads? No, sir. Were you not at all curious about that back stairway? No, sir, not at that point. Just curious, why was that? Well, we were, my primary concern was uh, preserving the crime scene. But surely, wouldn't that back stairway that led somewhere, presumably outside, be a part of your concern in terms of securing the area? Well, that's the reason we stationed a patrolman right there at the door who was just on the uh, top of that stairway. Mr. Papilla, when you left the bathroom and you proceeded alongside this stairway through the corridor there, you were passing this room, weren't you? Mm, yes, sir. Did you look in that room? No, sir. Is there a reason why you didn't look in that room? No particular reason. I hadn't received information that that room was possibly involved. Well, isn't that room in the same easterly location of the rooming house facing the motel as the bathroom? Yes, sir. And aren't there windows overlooking the motel from that room? I would assume so. I don't know. I didn't go in there and look or I hadn't seen the building from the outside. Thank you very much. No further questions. Neither William Anschutz nor Charlie Stevens is available to testify. By agreement of counsel, their original 1968 statements describing a shot coming from the bathroom of the rooming house are read to the jury. On two occasions during the afternoon, Anschutz tried to get into the bathroom at the end of the hall each time someone was in the bathroom. The second time Anschutz went to the bathroom, another neighbor, Charlie Stevens of apartment 6B, told Anschutz that a new tenant who rented apartment 5B was in the bathroom. Later, Anschutz heard a shot. He got up and went down to the door. As he opened it, a man came down the hall. Anschutz thought the man came out of apartment 5B, but he could not tell for sure. The man was running, and as he passed Anschutz's door, he held his hand and arm over his face so Anschutz could not get a good look at him. As the man passed Anschutz, Anschutz said, I thought I heard a shot. The man answered, yeah, it was a shot. He had something about this long indicating about three or three and a half feet wrapped up in a something. It might have been an old piece of blanket. After the man had run down the hall, Charlie Stevens came out of his apartment and said he had also heard a shot. The first couple of times the person from 5B went to the bath, he did not stay but a few minutes, and once I heard the toilet flush. Each time I heard footsteps going back to room 5B. About the third time I heard footsteps from room 5B to the bathroom, the person stayed what seemed like a long time. I heard the shot. I could tell that it came from the bathroom because it was very loud and the partition between my kitchen and the bathroom is thin plyboard. Question, do you know that this, white ma this male white came out of the bathroom immediately after the shot was fired? Answer, yes sir, I know it because that back door was closed and locked and he couldn't have got up the back steps. As the Memphis police converged on the rooming house, a bundle wrapped in a bedspread was discovered in the adjoining doorway of Knipe's amusement center. The bundle contained a 30-06 Remington pump-action rifle, alleged to be the murder weapon. Officer Dollahite found the bundle. How did you first find out about Dr. King being shot? Well, I was standing in the fire station near the pumpers, uh, and uh, some officers ran out of the back of the fire station yelling that uh, King had been shot. And then proceeded back south on Main Street and uh, 
I noticed a suitcase and a rifle and a blanket laying on the sidewalk uh, right in front of Knife's amusement center. And obviously in that particular picture, there's an officer standing there with a shotgun. Lieutenant Gormley and, this, and a police officer told this officer with a <coughs> shotgun in the picture to stand there and guard. Let me ask you this. You, you've described, Mr. Dollar Height, your route from the fire station, jumping down, coming over, and then coming around. How long would you say it took you? Less than two minutes. I would like to read the statement of Mr. Guy Warren Knipe, I'll call him, C-A-N-I-P-E, who is also deceased. I heard a package drop in my front door and looked to see what it was and got a glimpse of a man walking away from it. I walked out to the street to see who had laid the stuff there and no one was in sight. Immediately after, this white Mustang car pulled away from there. Question, did the two customers get a look at this male white? Answer, they said that they saw the man as he pulled off in a Mustang car. They said that was the man. They didn't pay no attention to it. I was informed that some articles had been found around on Main Street. And did you proceed around to those articles? I did. At the time you arrived over by the, on Main Street, can you say how that might have differed from what you're seeing in that photograph? It looked to be the same. Then did you, <clears throat> did you at some point actually take custody of the bundle that was laying there? I did. Did you turn these items over to any other law enforcement agency? I did. And who was that? The FBI. And and what what was the purpose for that? To transport to the lab in Washington. And was did you all have the lab in Washington do things for you from time to time on various murder cases? We did. I would hand you uh, what's been marked for PIA number seven. <clears throat> and I show you there a uh, photograph of a rifle. Does that appear to be uh, a photograph of what's listed as Q2 there? It does. And would you tell us what that, what that is? It's a 30 out 6 Springfield pump action 30 out 6 rifle. Zachary lists the items found in the bundle. The rifle, nine 30 out 6 cartridges, binoculars, a paper sack with the name York Arms Company, a zipper bag, cans of Schlitz beer, and a Memphis newspaper dated April 4th. Ray's lawyer cross-examined Zachary about why only one bullet was in the chamber of the rifle instead of a full clip. What did that mean to you when you learned of that? Well, it meant that there was one shot fired and it had not been e rejected, ejected to reload. What is, the, is there an advantage in using a clip? Well, if you want to get off some quick shots, it would, yes. Sir. You could get off several shots as fast as you could pump a new shell in the chamber. So he appeared to be intent on doing his deed with a single shot. That's what it would indicate to me, yes. Could we see um, photograph Zachary 10, the bullet? Would you tell us again what, uh, what this photograph depicts? The remains of the bullet removed from Dr. King's body. Is this the bullet, uh, the fatal bullet, the death slug, as you remember it, that was turned over to the FBI? It was. Joe Hester was the FBI case agent in the King case. He explains how the FBI traced the names of John Willard, Eric Galt, and Harvey Lohmeyer to James Earl Ray. At some point that evening, uh, were you directed to get involved in an investigation? We received a phone call from Bureau headquarters in Washington telling us that the Attorney General had ordered the FBI to get into the investigation. And do you know who the Attorney General was at that time? Ramsey Clark. 
I learned that the case was going to be assigned to me, which meant in FBI terms that I became the case agent. Jensen and I and some of the other agents went over to the Memphis Police Department and where we met with Inspector Zachary. As far as any evidence recovered uh, that day or that evening, do you know if any of that was taken that night and taken to Washington? We sent a young agent named Robert Fitzpatrick. We put him on a plane that night with all the physical evidence and sent him to Washington. Now, as far as were, were the local office of the FBI, were they out doing certain things? The, all we had the first day, all we had was the name Willard. Uh, on or about April the 8th, uh, did you all contact the Rebel Motel and get a registration from one Eric Galt uh, that a person by that name had stayed at the Rebel on the night of April 3rd and indicated he had a white Mustang. That was one of, that was one of the white Mustangs that we found. Now, I believe there was recovered some underwear and a t-shirt that had a laundry mark in it. What did you all do relative <laughs> to the laundry mark locally and then nationally? Several local people here were able to tell us that, yes, that's, a, that's a, a common machine made by a company, I think, up in the Midwest, if I'm not mistaken. And then you go to them, and you get a list of every laundry in the United States that has bought one of those machines. Right. So then, then, we, then we canvass every laundry that's on that list and finally hit one in Los Angeles, and the man identified the, the laundry mark as coming from his machine and identified it as belonging to a man named Galt. All right. So, so you, now you had the Rebel Motel receipt, Eric Galt, and you had the laundry, Eric Galt, right. in Los Angeles. On or about April 11th was a Mustang recovered in Atlanta. Yes, it was. And uh, was this in the name of a Galt? Yes. I, I guess for the first time, we really, we really thought we were looking for someone whose name might be Galt, because that was the, that was the only consistent name we had. Uh, uh, we had the Galt in, in, uh, that had bought the car, and then we had the Galt that had used the laundry out in California. Of course, it turned out that Eric Galt wasn't his true name, but at Did that point, we didn't know that. Ultimately... Can you tell us what was reported to you? Uh, when were you advised that, that it had been developed uh, that Mr. James Earl Ray might be Mr. Galt? Uh, I believe it was on, a, on or about uh, April 18th. So the FBI people in, in the identification division went through all the federal fugitives and lo and behold, there was James Earl Ray. And there had been a federal warrant issued for James Earl Ray because he was an escapee from the Missouri State Penitentiary. Was there any, best of your knowledge, as agent of the field office here in Memphis, was there any electronic surveillance or wiretapping imposed on Martin Luther King when he was inside the environs of Memphis, Tennessee? There was none, ever. And you state that categorically? Categorically. If it had occurred, Mr. Hester, would you have been aware of it? I feel certain I would have. Would you say from your long experience, Agent Hester, that when there was a killing of this sort, that that um, there is, in fact, uh, a, a type of national crisis which emerges, that grips the population. Absolutely. And you didn't feel, as the case agent, you didn't feel any undue pressure on you to bring this investigation to a close? Only to the extent that, that this was a, a, uh, a case that, that I desperately wanted to solve. 
Um, I would, I would have hated to have left the FBI and been known as the man who couldn't find the murderer of Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, so to that extent, I wanted to solve it. The rifle found outside the rooming house was traced to a gun dealer in Birmingham, Alabama, who remembers selling it to James Earl Ray using the alias Harvey Lohmeyer. He reviewed some of his uh, records, and he said that he had sold that gun to an individual by the name of Harvey Lohmeyer. In the Birmingham office of the FBI, were you all continuing to try to determine things about it? Uh, Eric Galt, Harvey Lohmeyer, John Willard? Oh, yes, sir. And did you receive any kind of communication from the Los Angeles office of the FBI uh, and sent, were you sent a photograph? Yes, we were. Right. Did you go out and see Don Wood again, uh, the man that ran the Aero Marine Supply Company? Yes, sir. He, he selected the photograph of uh, Eric S. Galt. As, as the man to whom he had sold uh, the rifle. Mr. Bonebrake, uh, following the shooting of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. here in the city of Memphis, were you uh, called upon to uh, perform some fingerprint comparisons on various items submitted to you uh, from Memphis and other locations? Yes, sir, I was. Did you make a comparison between the latent prints that you got, for example, off the rifle, the newspaper, the, the toilet kit, the scope? Uh, did you compare those prints with one another to determine if it was one and the same individual uh, making those prints? Yes, sir. The latent print on the side of the rifle and the latent fingerprint on the binoculars were both made by the same finger of an individual. But at that point, did you know who it was? No, sir, I did not. And at some point, did you find a comparison? Yes, sir. Uh, we matched this left thumb print with a fingerprint record, that being the fingerprint record of James Earl Ray. I'm a bit confused as to the range of uh, fingerprints, latent fingerprints, that were not identified in this case. So if you'll bear with me, I'd just like to call some of them out to you to see if you have any recollection of having been asked to identify these particular prints. Yes, sir. There was a, a, a latent uh, lift on the right side of the fireplace in room 5B at the rooming house. Yes, sir. Are you familiar with that print? I recall receiving a lift of that latent fingerprint, yes, sir. And you were not able to identify it? That, to my best of my knowledge, has not been identified with anyone. One palm print from a 1966 Mustang left door handle. Again, I don't believe it was ever identified. Why would you say no fingerprints could be identified, sort that I've just read to you, that were found in um, various significant areas of this case? Well, all I can say, sir, is I was never given the fingerprints of the, the, of the people that those belong to. But they didn't belong to James Earl Ray. That is correct. They did not. They belonged to some other person. Yes, sir. Can you explain what efforts were taken, that, of which you are personally aware, to find the owners of the fingerprints that exist in this case and that have remained unidentified to this day? Uh, I'm not aware of any effort made to identify those other fingerprints. Could we have the rifle? I would hand to you, Mr. Bonebrake, a, it's a replica of the uh, rifle, I think it was Q2, uh, recovered at the, in the bundle in Memphis. Would you... Uh, indicate where the print was on the rifle. I, t I trust the rifle's unloaded. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, it was, would be in this, this? May I approach, Your Honor? 
May I yes. approach? Or you yes. can stand up if you need to, I guess. <laughs> it would be in this position. Was it a left thumb? Left thumb print. All right. What about the, the print you say was on the scope? It, it was approximately this position here, and it's, it was the, as I recall, the right ring finger. Okay, the ring finger, is that the second one yeah, in? Yeah, this next to the little finger. Okay. All right, sir. With Ray now linked to the rooming house and the rifle, the prosecution attempts to show that Ray stalked Dr. King prior to the murder. As its principal evidence of stalking, the prosecution offers a copy of a map found in a room Ray rented in Atlanta. The prosecution claims that the map was marked by Ray to show the Atlanta locations of King's home, his church, and his headquarters. Did you become familiar with a map of Atlanta uh, in certain locations that we were trying to determine what was contained within certain circles? Yes, I did. This area C is up 14th Street and Peachtree. Are you familiar with with that location? Yes, I am. Did where the the address of James Garner's rooming house back in 1968, how did it compare with any of the circles which were transposed from the original Q176 map? Well, it was in the same proximity. Okay. In fact, uh, it was would have been within the circle. Okay. Did you go to uh, the area marked A, the circle at Auburn and Cortland Avenue? Yes, sir, I did. Right. And do you know what is in that area right now? Yes, that's a short distance from the Ebenezer Baptist Church and from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference headquarters. Now, did you go out to the area marked D? or, excuse me, B on this map. Yes, sir, I did. Did you also uh, go to an address known as 234 Sunset Avenue? Yes, sir, I did. Did you determine that to be the former residence of Martin Luther King, Jr.? Yes, sir, I did. Here it is right here. Okay, okay and if you again down at the bottom put Dr. King's residence. Uh, in respect of um, all of these locations and the marks that were denoting these locations, in any instance, was the um, Southern Christian Leadership Headquarters uh, or Dr. King's church or, or home um, within the circled area, as you have seen it and described it here this afternoon? The, the uh, SCLC and the Ebenezer Baptist Church were not within the circle. Mm -hmm. The uh, rooming house on 14th Street was within the circle. Right. The home of Dr. King was not within the circle, but was right near. The prosecution argues that Ray decided to go from Atlanta to Memphis only after Dr. King's plans were published in an Atlanta newspaper on March 30th and April 1st. Ray claims that he left Atlanta before knowing of Dr. King's plans. But the prosecution offers records from the Piedmont Laundry purporting to show that Ray, using the name Eric Galt, dropped laundry off in Atlanta on April 1st. Question, so you were at work on Monday, April 1, and on Friday, April 5. Answer right. Question, did you normally write the date on the ticket, the date that the customer arrived with laundry? Answer, yes, we did. We dated our book, put it on the counter, and dated the book for the day that we were working. Question, and would you please tell the committee what this book is? Answer, this is our counter book where we put the customer's name here. Question, what is the date on page 19? April, and her answer, page 19, April 1, 1968. Question, on what line do you find that? Answer, line 30 and 31. Question, in other words, Mrs. Peters, the entry of the name Eric Galt 
and the items that he requested to be cleaned reflect that laundry was brought in by a man by the name of Eric Galt on April 1. Answer, that's right. After presenting evidence that Ray was in Atlanta on April 1st, Hickman Ewing now calls a ballistics expert to explain the link between Ray's rifle and the death slug. Uh, House uh, Select Committee uh, on the Assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Yes, I did. Now, I would hand you a composite photo marked uh, Champagne Number 6. What was Q64? Uh, Q64 uh, in this uh, photograph represents uh, the uh, bullet fragments that were reportedly uh, removed from Dr. King. Uh, they, there are three fragments. Uh, one is the uh, base portion of uh, the bullet, one is a fragment of the bullet jacket, and one is a fragment of the uh, lead core material that is inside the metal jacket of the bullet. Okay, let me hand you, if I can have the deputy hand you a replica. Uh, now, this weapon is not loaded. Okay. Can you recognize that as a, as a weapon similar to uh, Q2? Yes. So what we have done is uh, we test fired the, the uh, rifle. Uh, I think about 12 times. In addition to your your test firing test firings in comparison, did you all have access to what the FBI had done in their uh, comparisons back in 1968? Yes, sir. We uh, we also had the test that they had fired. The 12 test firings that you did, could you determine scientifically and microscopically uh, whether or not those particular bullets or cartridges had been fired from the same weapon. Even though you knew that, could you do it microscopically? Uh, we were not able to identify conclusively any of the test bullets that we fired, one with the other, or could we identify our test bullets with the uh, test bullets that the FBI had fired, nor could we identify uh, the, any of the tests with the exhibit bullet fragments that we received or the, the murder slug, uh, the fragments cannot, you had. We could not identify the bullet fragments with any of the tests that we fired. Now, the class characteristics were the same. They were all in agreement, which indicated to us that uh, that weapon could have been used to fire the bullet fragments. But we could not find sufficient individual identifying features to say conclusively that this rifle was the one that was used to fire the bullet fragments. Now, the, in the class characteristics in this case of the death slug are six lands, six grooves, and a right twist. Is that right? That's correct, yes. Do you know, Mr. Champagne, how many Remington Game Master uh, 760 rifles were manufactured? No, sir, I have no idea. Could it be in the thousands? Oh, yes. Were all of these Remington Game Master 760 rifles manufactured with the same class characteristics as Q2 in this case? Uh, I believe they were. Can you um, state that the fatal death slug came from the cartridge case that was found in the weapon? No, sir, there's no scientific way that we can determine that. Can you say with uh, certainty on the basis of everything that you've testified here today that the weapon in this case, to the exclusion of all others, fired the death slug that killed Martin Luther King Jr.? No, I cannot say that, but... Uh, That's I'm, all. Thank you very much, Ron. Yeah, no, maybe you're allowed to finish his answer. Yeah. No, he, he had finished. Mr. Champagne, go ahead and finish. Uh, we found no indications uh, on the bullet that it wasn't fired uh, from that weapon. The prosecution offers expert medical testimony on the bullet's fatal path, its weight, and its alleged fragmentation in Dr. King's body. Doctor, let me ask you if in 1978 
you were uh, a part of the forensic pathology panel of the House Select Committee on the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Yes, uh, I was. I was chairman of that panel. Did you uh, actually come to Memphis? Yes. And if we could do this, uh, Mr. Deputy, if we could move this chart over here and we'll stick it up there on there. I believe there's a copy in the report that's similar. Can you see that, Doctor? Yes, if, I may. If you need to come down. May I approach? That would, yes, that would be very helpful. Thank you. You don't have your pointer. Oh, thank you. Uh, this was a reconstruction with the aid of uh, the medical illustrator showing the point of entrance of the uh, missile, which was a uh, 3006 uh, rifle bullet. And it entered Dr. King's lower jaw and cheek an inch to the right and a half inch below the angle of the mouth. The bullet impacted against the jawbone, the mandible, exited, re-entered just above the collarbone, and continued downward and toward the left uh, through uh, the vital structures of the neck. They're very important blood vessels in the neck area. And the most significant injuries were uh, fractures of three of the spine bones of the cervical, of the vertebra. The bullet fragmented in many pieces, they're little black flecks, and a major bulk of it was recovered in the left back area, up about uh, two inches to the left of the midline of the back, underneath the skin. And that uh, was recovered just beneath the skin in the upper back, and that was a little less than half the, the weight of the bullet. The bullet would have normally weigh uh, 150 grains, and what was recovered was 64 and a half grains, so that um, the rest of the bullet fragments, in our judgment, was accounted for by the uh, breakup uh, as seen on the x-ray. Prosecutor Ewing now introduces Ray's flight to Canada as evidence of guilt. Ewing points to Ray's obtaining Canadian passports under false names, permitting him to travel to London and to Lisbon, Portugal. Hickman Ewing closes the prosecution's case with Ray's alleged statement to Scotland Yard when he was finally arrested in London in June 1968. What is your name? He replied, I can't understand why I am here. My name is Sneed. I said, would you like to tell us why you are carrying a gun at all? He replied, I am going to Brussels. Well, really, I am thinking of going on to Rhodesia, and things are not too good there just now. I said, I now believe your name is not Sneed, but James Earl Ray, also known as Eric Starvo Galt. The accused had been standing up, but at this he suddenly slumped down onto the seat, put his head in his hands, and said, Oh, God, after a minute or so, he added, I feel so trapped. Your Honor, at this time, the state of Tennessee would rest its case against James Earl Ray for the murder of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. The defense is about to begin its case. James Earl Ray does not have to prove his innocence. He need only establish a reasonable doubt. Ray's lawyer, William Pepper, will seek to establish reasonable doubt in at least four ways. First. Pepper will seek to undermine the effort to link Ray to the fatal shot. He will attack the reliability of Charlie Stevens' statement that the shot came from the rooming house bathroom and will emphasize the failure to prove that the death slug came from Ray's rifle. Second, he will have Ray explain his presence at the rooming house and his purchase of a 30 6 rifle by describing a figure he calls Raoul whom Ray says enticed him to Memphis as part of a gun-running scheme. Third, Pepper will argue that King was the target of a sophisticated conspiracy far beyond the capacities of James Earl Ray. He will question the withdrawal of a black policeman and two black firemen before the shooting and the physical alteration on the morning after of the bushes that covered the vacant lot across from the Lorraine Motel. 
And finally, the defense will contend that the fatal shot was fired from a second 30 6 rifle by an assassin hidden in the bushes of the vacant lot across from the Lorraine Motel. The uh, defense at this time calls to the stand uh, James Earl Ray. James, would you please rise uh, so that his honor may swear you in. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Please be seated. <laughs> James, at the outset, even though it's not been made an issue in this case, would you care to comment on the various allegations of uh, racism that have been directed at you? Well, I've never been involved in any type of uh, racial uh, hostilities against another race or nationality. Mm -hmm. Now, James, um, did you receive tri training with a rifle uh, when you were in the Army? Well, when they transferred me to the infantry, everyone had to uh, have training with rifles, yes. They had three grades. Uh, I believe the top was what, what is what's referred to as the next part marksman. And then the, the next grade was a sharpshooter. And then the last grade was a marksman. And the, everyone had to be a marksman or, you know, they just keep you on the firing range until you qualified as a marksman. And what was your, uh, what was your competency? What was your rating as a, uh, with a rifle? I, I was a marksman. Ray talks of his life as a criminal, culminating in a 20-year sentence for armed robbery in 1960. Ray explains that he fled to Canada in 1967 after escaping from a federal prison hidden in a bread truck. It's in Montreal that Ray says he first met Raoul some nine months before the murder of Dr. King. Did you, during this period, in your early days in Montreal, begin to frequent a, a bar called the Neptune? Well, yes, after, after it came about that I didn't think I'd get a passport through uh, legitimate channels, then I started to visit some bars around there. And uh, anyway, the second time I was in a Neptune, I, I met an I was in there drinking, and an individual come up and sat down at the bar, and the tables, the, really tables. And he introduced himself as Raul. He come down and uh, sat down beside of me. And Could you describe this individual? He had uh, a very slight uh, Spanish accent, and uh, he looked like a Spaniard, and he had this dark hair. Did he indicate to you that he could provide you with a passport? Sub subsequently did, yes. And uh, what was it you came to believe that he wanted from you? He wanted me to cross the border in Canada and take some, uh, take these packages across for him, and, uh, and I agreed to it. Ray testifies that Raul paid him to carry contraband across the Canadian and Mexican borders on several occasions. On one trip across the Canadian border, Ray claims to have paid a small customs duty on a television set. Ray then testifies about Raul's direction that he leave Los Angeles for Atlanta in March 1968. Uh, after I was there about, I guess about two days, uh, I went down and bought a map of Atlanta. I always do buy a map where you know, city of men and, uh, and try to get my bearings and, uh, and then, uh, uh, I made, I, I made some markings on the map about, uh, and, uh, Okay, so in, in any event, you, um, you're stating that you tried to make some marks to, to generally orient yourself and give yourself some yes. bearing. Yes. And when do you recall putting your laundry in for cleaning? Well, I, I'm, I'm kind of, I feel very strongly that that would have been on the 28th of March. You realize over the years that this date has become um, a bone of contention, do you not? Yes, yes. So you don't see any real significance and ma uh, material significance in terms of this, this date at all. Is that what you're saying? No, I, I didn't consider it important, but I just uh, wondered how come that uh, they wouldn't have me in Atlanta on April 1st. There must have been a reason why it's, you know... Uh, James, when Raoul returned on the 29th, uh, what did he uh, suggest that you do? Uh, well, well, generally what he suggested was that uh, his, his uh, plan is the outline of me. He was going to purchase some rifles and military equipment and take it into Mexico. And then uh, he wanted me to buy the, the equipment and then uh, we'd go to uh, Memphis and uh, we showed, showed the gun dealers. 
And he suggested uh, that uh, when he came back on the 29th that uh, that uh, we go somewhere in Atlanta and and I would uh, I would purchase a gun and also I would check on some foreign-made rifles. I had identification in Birmingham, Alabama, and possibly if I had to show identification or something, I you know I sh I, uh, I should buy it in the same state where you know where I was uh, living at. On the 29th of March, you drove with Raul to Birmingham. Yes. He wanted me to buy a purchase, a, uh, a uh, new rifle and, uh, and a scope on it. And uh, he gave me uh, about $700 to purchase this, this equipment. This so equipment? Then, I, by this equipment, what do you mean? Well, this rifle and the scope. So I drove on back. I drove the Air Marines, Air Marine Supply and I went in and talked to the, one of the salesmen, and uh, I just uh, asked him for a rifle. And he showed me one. I said, that, you know, I said that's okay, and uh, this, you know, puts some, uh, you know, ammunition in it. I give the uh, the clerk a name of a Harvey Lohmeyer. So I went on back to the motel, and uh, and uh, and uh, you showed it to Ryle, and he said it was the wrong kind. So uh, I had just broke short, so I just sold it over on his lap. And I said, well, just you know, just pick out what you want, and I'll. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll change it. Do you yeah. recall um, the type of weapon he uh, uh, then instructed you to buy or identified in the brochure? Yeah, he pointed out, uh, I found out it was, you know, it was a 30.6, 30, 30.6, 30 uh, I believe you call them. Well, it was going to be, be a display to gun dealers. That's what uh, his cover story was. And where were these gun dealers going to see the gun? They were going to stay in Memphis. Ray exchanged the rifle for a 30 6 Remington the next morning, March 30th, in Birmingham. Ray testifies that Raul directed him to bring the new rifle to the new Rebel Motel in Memphis on April 3rd. Ray's movements during the next few days are in dispute. Ray says that he leisurely drove from Birmingham to Memphis. The prosecution claims that Ray returned to Atlanta to stalk Dr. King. In any event, Ray testifies that he rejoined Raul at the New Rebel Motel in Memphis on April 3rd. He showed up about, uh, I, I would estimate about 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock that evening? Yes. Can you tell us what transpired when he entered the room? Uh, he wanted a rifle, which I, I gave at that time, and he, wrote, he wanted me to meet him at an address, which was a, 422 and a half Main Street on South Main Street in Memphis. He told me he wanted to meet him there tomorrow, the next day at uh, 3 o'clock. And uh, generally that was it. Then he left and... Uh, Did you ever see that gun again, that rifle again? No. We'll continue and move to the morning of April 4th, 1968. The next day, April 4th, Ray testifies that after changing a flat tire on his white Mustang, he met Raul at Jim's Grill, located on the ground floor of the rooming house at 422 and a half South Main. There he rented room 5B, using the name John Willard. And can you describe as best as possible uh, where you parked your car? I would say the front, the front of the car was maybe about uh, three or four yards from uh, Jim's grill. Uh, Raul, he was in there, and uh, we just had a brief conversation. And uh, walk, we were walking towards the door, and he, you know, he mentioned uh, that I should uh, rent a room upstairs. We'd be there three, four days, and uh, he also was seemed to be very interested in the Mustang, and, and he wanted to where it was at. So. Uh, I went on uh, upstairs to rent a room, and I assumed that uh, the, d the day before that, uh, he'd want, he wanted to rent the, r rent the room in the name of uh, Eric Galt, uh, in, <clears throat> in my name. So I told him I thought that would be a mistake, I th and I gave him the name of John Willard. Well, I could see inside the office, and uh, there's a lady in there, uh, which I later found out her name was Bessie Brewer. She said she had two rooms. She said she had a light housekeeping room and a sleeping room. So I told her just the sleeping room. So she said, okay. Now, she, there's a possibility she, she routinely showed me the, uh, the light housekeeping room. I don't recall, correctly recall. And where did you go after you uh, went back to the office? Well, I signed a ledger book up there under the name of John Willard. And after I signed the ledger book, I went back to the room and uh, 
I was back there. I wasn't over three or four minutes, and uh, and Raul, he came, he came, uh, he came in there. He wanted me to uh, uh, buy a, a go down and try to purchase a, some binoculars with uh, infrared attachments. He called them. So you went into the York Arms store, and what happened then? Did you buy these binoculars? Well, uh, I asked I asked the salesman if he had any binoculars and uh, these infrared attachments, and uh, and. Uh, he told me that uh, he had some binoculars, but he didn't have any attachments. And uh, anyway, we come some type of agreement on 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 a pair of them, fairly cheap. And uh, so so uh, I, I agreed to I agreed to, to purchase them. Then I went back to back to the uh, back to to the room house where Raul was. Now he told me the gun dealers were going to be up there, and, and he didn't want me uh, you know be around when they come up there. And of course, I didn't want to be around anyway. And he asked me to go to a movie somewhere and uh, stay two, three hours and, uh, and come back later on. And he also asked me to, uh, you know, leave the Mustang out front because uh, uh, he would probably uh, need it that night, that evening. So you left the uh, the room. Did you go out of the rooming house at that point? And where did if yes. you did where did you go? Uh, I stopped in a, another bar again, and I didn't particularly care about going to the movie. Well, while I was sitting there, I had a flat tire that, that morning, and I thought if he, was, uh, if he was going to use the car and he had a flat tire or something, he might have a problem. So I figured I'd just run back and get the tire fixed real quick, and then I was looking for a service station. I, don't, I, don't, I, I didn't drive very far, and it was just a block or so, and uh, th there was a service station there, and I, I, uh, I pulled into it, and I asked the, uh, the attendant if he could uh, you know, fix the tire, and his, uh, his position, he, he meant something about it's kind of busier, I come back or something like that. Well, well I didn't have time to, uh, you know, wait around. I don't want to wait around an hour. I decided to, I'd just take the car on back. When you yes. got to the corner of Calhoun and Maine, what did you observe and what did you do? I have a strong re recollection of seeing a police car uh, parked some, somewhere in the street. And also uh, possibilities, uh, what looked like policemen uniforms. So uh, instead of instead of turning right and going back down in, the, in front of Jim's Grill, I turned left. Well, it was my intention to drive outside on the outskirts of Memphis and, and make a phone call to Rawls Intermediary in New Orleans and try to find out if anything, what if anything is going on there. I thought there's always a possibility that there was uh, apparently guns around there and gun transactions that the, the police might have run in there. And so I just started driving slowly out to South Main Street in southern southerly direction. And after about 15 minutes, or maybe 10 or 15 minutes, uh, I had a radio on. There's a report on the radio that uh, uh, Martin Luther King had been shot. What did you do after you heard this broadcast? Well, I just kept driving. I didn't think too much at the time. And then uh, about 10 minutes later, uh, there was a report that they were looking for a, a, a white man in a white Mustang, which... Uh, could have fit my description, and I, I assumed there's a strong possibility I may have been in some trouble. So I decided then I'd go back to uh, back to uh, uh, Atlanta, and uh, then if uh, the news wasn't any better, I'd go, you know I'd get out of the country. James O. Ray, on the 4th of April, 1968, at approximately 6:01 in the afternoon, did you fire? shoot at and murder Martin Luther King, Jr.? Uh, no, I didn't. No further questions. <clears throat> Mr. Ray, have you ever told a lie before? Have I ever told one before? Yes, sir. Oh, wh what time, you, what, what type of lie are you referring to? A political promise or just a... Well... Hmm. Let, let's just ask the question. Have you ever told a lie in your life? Let's well, I was, obviously, obviously I've told a lot of, uh, you know, aliases and things of that nature, yes. Mr. Ray, you, how many aliases have you used uh, in your life? Uh, I've used a lot of them. I, I don't know just how many. Uh, probably uh, 15 or 20 of them at least. All right, and every time you use an alias, if you tell me your name is Eric Gall, that wouldn't mm -hmm. be true, would it? 
I don't make a big project of it. I don't say read my lips. And uh, I, it's not uh, the way I use it, something like a, a political promise. Now, a politician, he'll say uh, he's going to do, do this and that on an issue. And when he gets in office, well, he'll say, well, I had to make uh, the, the uh, situation change, so I had to modify my position. Well, that's the same way with me. When I escaped from prison, uh, the, my situation uh, changed, so I had to modify my position, and uh, consequently I had to change my name and use some aliases. If a politician makes a campaign promise and he breaks it, he's lied, hadn't he? Well, he, he doesn't say he's lying, no. I know he doesn't course, say he's yes, lying, yes. and you're not saying you're lying, but that's what I'm trying to get you. If you tell me your name's Eric Galt, that's a L-I-E lie, isn't it? That, 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 yes, that's a lie. It's okay, a, thank it's you. It's false and that's it, no? Do you remember toward the end of your time at Leavenworth when they were going to transfer you to the to the camp outside the wall and you refused to go because there were black prisoners out there? No, that's not exactly correct, no. All right, well, tell us what happened. I had about four or five months to go, and they asked me if I wanted to go to the farm, and I said, yes, I guess so. It's a trustee job. And I went out in the population and talked to some of the, some of the inmates out there, Pacific and one Ralph Davis who I knew in Quincy, Illinois, and I told him, I said, well, I, I think they offered me a farm job and I'm going out there. He said, if you do go out there, there's, there's a possibility you get, you get 10 years for, for drugs. And uh, he said that uh, some of the blacks out there uh, use marijuana. And I, generally, I knew that was about correct because in the prison at that time, most of the whites were making a homemade whiskey and the blacks were using the, the uh, marijuana. The blacks and Mexicans would use marijuana. Well, to use uh, a form of question I've heard in this trial, would you be surprised if the prison record from Leavenworth said the reason you wouldn't go out there because blacks were there? I wouldn't be surprised at all because these documents have been falsified for, for years. Uh... Now, you've stated and, and uh, talked about being in the Army and you went through the classifications of uh, qualifying with rifles. I believe that's correct. But you had to qualify, you did qualify as a marksman, did you not? You, you have to qualify as a marksman, and they'll, they'll keep you out there six months on the rifle range, yes. Well, how long did it take you to stay? Are you, are you trying to represent to this court and jury that you stayed out there on the range six months before you qualified as a marksman? No, I qualified as a marksman when I first went out there. I think your testimony is you normally carry your pistols, and you bought a lot of them over the years. Yes. And so let's say you, you went into a place, and you, you had a pistol to rob somebody. You pull the pistol out, don't you? Yes. And, and your position is you hope they'll be intimidated enough. They'll give you the money, and you'll leave, and you'll have some money, and everybody will live happily ever after. Well, <laughs> Well, generally, that's, 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 that's what it amounts to, yes. All right. So if you go into a place and you've got your pistol here and you say, okay, give me your money, and they pull a pistol out, you're telling us that you'd probably just say, okay, uh, I give up. Well, I, I'd say let's make a deal here. You, know, uh, you put yours up and I'll put mine up and that'll be it. Now, you, you say that while you're in Montreal, you met, meet this person you kept identifying as Raul. What's Raul's yeah. last name? I, re I really don't know his last name. He didn't tell me, and I didn't make any inquiries. Did, did you fill out an employment application up there at the Neptune Bar, Mr. Ray? Employment application? Yes, sir. I, I, I don't mean that he, a, a written application, but did he, did y'all in your conversation, did you tell him, uh, yes, sir, Mr. Raul, I'm an experienced armed robber, I'm a burglar, uh, and I'm an escape artist. Did you tell him those three things? I didn't tell him I was escape artist and all that stuff or anything like that. That's your terms. Now, Mr. Ray, you claim that you went down to the border between Canada and the United States, and you related that you brought some stuff across the border. Mr. Ray, you do know that they checked all those customs receipts up there, and they can find absolutely no record of your paying uh, $4 or whatever it was on the TV set. I don't know if they have or not. Now, I believe you said that you arrived in Birmingham, and then at some point you got a letter from Raul. Is that right? 
Uh, yes, yes, that's correct. I mean, did he, how did he, I mean, what kind of letter, what, Dear Eric, uh, meet me at the Starlight, here are the dates, yours very truly, Raul, your boss? From what I remember, it was a type, it was a typewritten note, and he had his name at the bottom. Did you write a letter later on from Los Angeles uh, to the American Southern Africa Council uh, requesting information about being able to go to Rhodesia? To, to, to immigrate to Rhodesia? Yes, sir. Well, that was just one of the various places that uh, I was trying to find out, you know, if I could get there. Uh, Did you know that George Wallace was running for president? Are trying to get on the ballot in California in the presidential race. Yes, I'd sub subsequently learned about that. Uh, uh, did did you get a, a telephone at the apartment that you rented out there? And that, yes. Did you tell the people when you got that phone that you needed a phone because you were working for George Wallace uh, for president? It, I, I don't really know why I told him when I, when I when I ran the phone. But at that time, I was thinking about using that, using that organization as a, as a cover, yes. And this is the same George Wallace that was governor of Alabama. Yes, that's the same one, yes. Would you say it as a coincidence that on the day you put the address change in that Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Uh, was in Los Angeles on that weekend, speaking on the 16th and 17th of March? I know what you're getting at the, 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 about me following Martin Luther King, uh, you know, out of Los Angeles to uh, wherever he's going. But uh, I filed a change of address before uh, his name became known in the Los Angeles Examiner. In March of 1977, do you recall this question and this answer? Question, roughly a month before the Martin Luther King killing, you left California and were coming back to the Deep South. The question is whether you left a forwarding address in California for Atlanta. Answer by you. I think, let's see, when I left, no, I, I, I can say with almost certainty under oath that I didn't leave no forwarding address. And then Mr. Rather asked, you were coming back to the Deep South, why? And your answer, well, that was on request, the New Orleans. But there was never, in fact, I never, I never knew I was going to Atlanta until I arrived in Birmingham. And there was no forwarding address, and of course, that would be very damaging against me. But I'm, I'm just 199% positive there was no, no forwarding address. If I would have left it anywhere, it would have been Birmingham, because that's where I had my identification. Did you tell Dan Rather that in March of 1977? Yes, I told him that, and then and I went back and looked over my... I hadn't studied, studied the case for three years, and I went back and looked over my records later on. He talked to me about three or four hours, and I suppose he was trying to get some, you know, damaging statements against me. Okay. Hickman Ewing cross-examines Ray about his alleged stalking of Dr. King in Selma, Alabama, and Atlanta, Georgia. Did you see that map? Uh, yes, I can see it. Yes. And is it your testimony you were going from New Orleans to Birmingham, but somehow you ended up in Selma? Uh, y yes, that, 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 that's, that's correct, yes. Would you agree with me that Selma does not appear to be on the road from New Orleans to Birmingham? Well, look, those roads run kind of funny. Neither one of them leads directly to Birmingham, but I see, I see what the point you're trying to make. That, uh, it, it's not not uh, on on the road to Birmingham. Do you do you say that's a, a coincidence that you just happened to be in Selma, Alabama, at or about the time Dr. King was due there? Well, well, he's he's he travels all over. I've been several towns. Uh, you know, when he's uh, certain in the area, I was in Chicago and he came up there, and I was in Los Angeles. And uh, I mean, I I don't I don't know where he was at at that time. Subsequently, I learned that he was somewhere in the southern uh, Alabama when I was in Birmingham and, uh, and around Selma, yes. Now, have you seen the, the map that was introduced during the government, the state's case in this case? Yes, yes, I recall that, yes. Mr. Ray, you, you are in the city of Atlanta, 
And did you mark the map? Did you place marks on the map? Yes, I, I placed uh, four marks on the map. And, and if we could have number A, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference uh, headquarters and the church are located on Auburn Avenue at the intersection of Jackson uh, and the intersection of Hilliard. Do, do you admit or deny making that circle there in 1968? No, I, I didn't make no circle there. I, I did make an oblong mark somewhere in that general area. Your explanation is when you were in Selma and Atlanta that you were never stalking Dr. King. Is that your position? No, th th that's my position, yes. You say that Raul, tell me again, Raul says to you, Eric, I want you to buy a, a gun. D did he ask you to do that? He asked me to do that in Atlanta, yes. You say you had to go to Alabama because you had an Alabama ID, but you didn't use your ID for Galt. You used another alias, Lohmeyer. Isn't that right? Uh, yeah, that's correct, yes. I thought it would be better because I had Alabama identification. And in, 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 in Birmingham, if the, the, the sporting goods store wouldn't have sold me the gun without identification, then I could just went somewhere else in the town and, and, and displayed my Alabama driver's license and, you know, got the... Uh, purchased the 